Hi. Okay, let's start with chapter four of the bronze bow. The Sabbath morning was very still. Not a grindstone rumbled, not a voice was upraised. No puff of smoke rose from the clay ovens. No women passed on their way to the well. Descending the ladder to the house, Daniel found a handful of olives and a cold crust of bread waiting for his breakfast. The little goat wandered in the small garden patch behind the house. Very early in the day, when Daniel was already wondering how he could endure another hour, Simone came to the door. His knock sent Leah cowering into a corner. Daniel hastily went out into the road, shutting the door behind him. I'm on my way to the synagogue, Simone said. I'd like you to go with me. Daniel scowled. I haven't been to synagogue for five years, he countered. One more Sabbath won't matter. On the contrary, Simone answered with a smile. Today is none too soon. Daniel's lips tightened. He bent and picked up a pebble and shied it at a little green lizard that had crawled from under the house. Simone's eyebrows lifted. Probably it was against the law to throw a stone on the Sabbath. There's a man I'd like you to see, Simone told him. They say he will visit our synagogue this morning. Daniel glanced up. Beneath the words was a hint he could not miss. What sort of man? I'm not sure, said Simone. He comes from Nazareth. Not said it in Hebrew. Not said it. Good reasons to stay away, grumbled Daniel, then feeling the pressure of Simone's silence. A zealot? It may well be. Come and see what you make of him. In these clothes? I have brought you a cloak and shoes. Daniel stared at his friend. If Simone, stickler for the law, had carried a bundle on the Sabbath just so that Daniel could see this man, he must consider the matter important. Daniel took the cloak and went inside the house. His grandmother was nodding again in the corner. She looked up and muttered his father's name, her eyes confused with sleep. Leah crept forward shyly and bent to fasten the leather sandal. "'Will you go with me?' he asked on impulse, and could have bitten his tongue at the terror that leaped into her blue eyes. Ne "'Never mind, I didn't mean it,' he said miserably, jerking away from her. Simone looked him over with, the, with approval as he stepped out into the roadway. "'How does it seem to be home?' he inquired. "'You call this home?' Daniel burst out. "'My grandmother does nothing but sleep, and my sister is possessed by demons.' "'She's no better?' "'Before I was apprenticed, when she was five years old, she hid herself in that house. "'In all this time, she has never stepped outside the door. "'So I've heard. "'The demons must have a strong hold. "'Yet she does good weaving.' I understand. Your grandmother sells it in Chorazin. Chorazin. Daniel had not paid much attention to the loom in the corner, but now Simone's words somewhat lightened his shame. Who is this man we go to see? He asked, not wanting to think about Leah. Jesus, Yeshua, son of Joseph, Yosef, a carpenter by trade. He has left his work and goes about preaching from town to town. Preaching? I thought you said he was a zealot. He preaches of the coming of the kingdom. You have heard him? No, but I have seen him. I journeyed to Nazareth with a friend who went to arrange for a wife. While we were there, this carpenter came back to preach in his own synagogue. A town like Nazareth must have boasted. They did not boast. They tried to kill him.
Daniel glanced quickly at his friend, his curiosity roused, not so much by the words as by the tone of Simone's voice. But Simone had no time to say more. They were approaching the small stone and plaster building in the center of the village, and men and women brushed close to them on either side of the road. Daniel had to stoop to go through the low doorway. He sidled close to the wall, tensing his muscles, conscious of his shaggy height and his wide shoulders, trying to draw in and make himself smaller. But soon he realized that today there was no curiosity to spare for him. He was sure the synagogue had never been so full in his childhood. Close together on the low benches huddled the men of the town their knees drawn up almost to their chins. They sat in an order of their trades, the skilled artisans nearest the pulpit, the silversmiths, the tailors, and sandal makers. Farther back sat the bakers, the cheesemakers, and dyers, and along the walls where Daniel and Simone had taken their places stood the lower tradesmen and the farmers. Still others crowded in the doorway, and many, he saw, would have to stand outside in the road. But the, by the rustle and murmur behind the grilled screen that separated the women's section, many of the men had brought their wives with them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. The beginning of that goes, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, is one Lord. The great words of the Shema rolled through the synagogue. For a moment, Daniel was caught up by them as he had been in his childhood. But as the long passage of the law was read aloud in Hebrew and then carefully translated into Aramaic, the language which the people spoke and understood, his attention began to wander. Though the throng of men sat respectfully, he could feel their restlessness also, and the anticipation that mounted moment by moment. They knew that by custom, a visiting rabbi, a ravi, would be invited to come forward and read from the Torah, the Torah, Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. When the long-awaited moment came, every man turned to watch the stranger who made his way to the platform. The man's figure was not in any way arresting. He was slight with the knotted arms and shoulders of one who has done hard labor from childhood. He was not regal or commanding. He was dressed simply in a plain white tallit that reached to his feet, his white head covering drawn closely over his forehead and hanging to his shoulders, hid his profile. Yet, when he turned and stood before the congregation, Daniel was startled. All at once, nothing in, this room, in the room was distinct to him but this man's face. A thin face, strongly cut. A vital, radiant face, lighted from within by a burning intensity of spirit. Yes, Daniel thought, his own spirit leaping up. This man is a fighter. He is one of us. Jesus, Yeshua, received the scroll and stood unrolling it with reverence, as though he were seeking for some passage already determined in his own mind. Then he raised his eyes and spoke from memory. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 
A shock ran through Daniel at the first words, a gentle voice barely raised. It carried to every corner of the room, warm, vibrant, with a promise of unlimited power. It was as though only a fraction of that voice were being used, as though if the full force of it were unstopped, it would roll like thunder. Yeshua, Jesus, closed the book and gave it back to the attendant. The waiting congregation seemed to surge forward and to hold its breath. Again, that voice made the blood leap in Daniel's veins. I say to you, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Now, Daniel leaned forward, tell us that the moment has come. Tell us what we are to do. Longing swelled unbearably in his throat. But Yeshua, Jesus, went on speaking quietly. A rippling murmur passed across the crowd. Others, too, waited for the word that was not spoken. What had the man meant? He had said liberty for the oppressed. Why didn't he call them to arms against the oppressor? Repent, he said now. Repent, as though that could rid them of the Romans. Disappointed and puzzled, Daniel leaned back. The fire that had leaped up in him died down. The man's voice had been like a trumpet call. Yet, where did the call lead? Had Simone understood? Daniel stayed close beside his friend as the crowd, crowds streamed from the synagogue at the close of the service. Is he a zealot or isn't he? He demanded as soon as they had outdistanced the others. What do you think? said Simon. I couldn't tell. Why did they try to kill him and not said it? They said he blasphemed. Some of them said he had set himself up as God's anointed, a common carpenter's son. They were beside themselves. How did he get away? Simone slowed his steps. I'm not quite sure, he said, though I was there and saw it. I didn't know what it was all about, but you know how it is with a crowd. I ran with them, and I am ashamed to tell it. I had a stone in my hand, too. They dragged him up the hill to a cliff, and they meant to push him over. But just at the edge of the cliff, they fell back, and he stood there alone, looking at them. I don't know how it was with them, but all at once I was ashamed. Terribly ashamed of the stone in my hand. Then he walked back down the hill, and not one of them touched him. Didn't he fight to defend himself? No, he was not angry. He was just not afraid. I have never seen anyone so completely not afraid. Strange. Daniel would have liked the story better if the man had fought back. He was vaguely disappointed, let down as he had been in the synagogue. He scuffed along the dusty road beside Simone. I can't make the man out, he said finally. What did he mean that the day is at hand? Simone walked on for a moment, his eyes on the ground. I don't know what he meant, he said slowly but I intend to find out. At a crossroads, Simone left him. I will look in on you tomorrow, he said. Keep the cloak. It is an old one, but you may have some use from it. Daniel walked on through the noonday heat, lingering to peer furtively at the people who passed. Though he shrank from their curious glances, he was in no hurry to return to his grandmother's house. 
Without warning, the sound of a trumpet split the Sabbath calm. Instantly, the peace around him dissolved into terror. There was a frantic scramble to be out of the road. Ahead of Daniel, two women and a child darted senselessly to one side and then the other. The younger ran back to jerk her child after her, the older woman shrieking at them both. Barely was the way cleared when a detachment of Roman cavalry trotted by, the horses' hoofs sending up a choking cloud of dust. In the rear, four soldiers suddenly reined in, horses rearing and stood guard. Some distance behind them marched a detachment of foot soldiers. Paralyzed with hatred, Daniel watched them. This was not the same as looking down from the mountain. Here he could see them plainly. They were not even Romans, but Samaritan auxiliaries, traitors paid to fight in Caesar's army. He watched their brutish faces pass, one after another, looking neither right nor left, to smash those faces, even one of them. He bit and picked up a rock. Infidels, he shouted. A hand slapped down over his mouth. Another hand gripped his upraised arm and forced it back. He felt himself jerked flat against a wall, held fast, while two men stepped in front of him, between him and the marching soldiers. With the sharp pressure of their hands on him, Daniel's senses came back. He stood still, not trying to fight them off. He saw that they had acted so quickly that not a soldier had noticed. The detachment went on down the road, their laced boots slapping in an unbroken rhythm. "'Gone,' said a voice, and no trouble, praise God. "'No thanks to this one,' another, one, another voice rasped. Abruptly the hands released his jaw and wrist. "'Are you possessed?' one man hissed. "'One of those hotheads,' the other scoffed. Another came closer, peering into his face. "'Who are you, boy? Not one of ours, that's sure.' Daniel looked back at them sullenly. I am Daniel, bar Yamin. Son of Yamin? Wasn't it your father who— Yes. Then you ought to know better. Do you want to bring the same curse down on all of us? I despise them, cried Daniel. I've taken an oath. Keep your oath to yourself, a man warned. You zealots cause nothing but trouble. You'll have every village in Galilee burned to the ground like Sephoris. Daniel knew he had behaved like a fool, but he would never admit it. He jerked away from them and walked scornfully down the road to the narrow alley that led to his grandmother's house. At sundown, the clear, clear piping of the horn announced the end of the Sabbath. Promptly, his grandmother snuffed out the Sabbath lamp, which had been burning ever since his arrival, and wrapped it carefully to put away for another week. The shadows settled closer around the one remaining flame in its saucer of smoking oil. With relief, Daniel perceived that it was time to take himself to the rooftop for another night. He was not sleepy. The long afternoon of inactivity had left his body restless. He was hungry, despite the sacrifice of the two women who had barely touched the food. He sat on the rooftop and felt the village steaming and seething around him in the dark, like a great pot of stew. He hated the stifling, foul-smelling streets, the miserable houses crowded close together. He hated this moldering house, filled with the sighs of his grandmother and the murmuring voice of Leah. Here in the village, who cared about the dream of freedom? Even Simone was counting content to wait and talk, never to act. The man who had spoken, though, Yeshua of Nazareth? There had been a moment when he first stood up to speak, when it had seemed, but it had come to nothing. More words, nothing but words. He knew one man who still dared to act. One of these days Rosh would show them all. One day Rosh's army would be strong enough, and then these timid men in the village would come scrambling to throw in their lot with him. And when that day came, he, Daniel, bar -Yamin, would show them too. When the Romans were defeated and the last of them had gone, he would come back. He would build a good house for his grandmother and Leah, and there would be plenty to eat, and a good life for them at last. 
and there would be no more giving way on the road and looking over their shoulders before they dared to whisper. But everyone would walk free. In the darkness, Daniel climbed down the ladder. He caught the faint note of a bell as the little goat shifted in its sleep. For an instant he wavered. Would Leah be sorry when she woke and found him gone? Then he pushed back his doubts. Some day, very soon, he would come back and make it up to her. He walked through the narrow streets and struck off toward the hills. He walked swiftly, his feet sure on the rocky trail. Toward midnight, he came to the foot of the steep ascent and led, that led to the cave. His heart began to beat strongly and joyfully. As he started up the last climb, a dark shape moved out from the boulders above, loomed for an instant against the sky, and then came soundlessly down toward him. In the dim light, he could see the white gleaming arc that split the shadowy face. Ho, oh, Samson, he called out, I've come back. And that is the end of chapter four of the bronze bow. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom.